Wow. Hello, everyone. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us on the very first day of MozFest to discuss the rise of workplace surveillance hardware and software and how we can collectively build a movement to challenge it. We are also going to dovetail into a conversation about the Global Digital Compact that the UN Secretary General has proposed along with WSIS Plus 20 because a moment of change is coming in the internet governance ecosystem with several events and statements of principles attracting growing attention as an opportunity to rethink how we as a society make decisions about the internet for the 2040s and beyond. My name is Aiden Fadeline. I will be the moderator of today's session. I am a Landaka Democracy Fellow with Humanity in Action in partnership with the Alfred Landaka Foundation. And I'm pleased to be joined by our esteemed panel. We have Eduardo Carrillo, the co-director of the Paraguayan nonprofit TEDIC. We have Stephanie Perrin, who is on the advisory board of the Electronic Privacy Information Center and was previously the recipient of EFF's Pioneer Award. And we have Rashi Saxana, a social innovation practitioner and community builder. And we of course also have our great uh, audience with us. And I want to encourage you to also ask any questions you like. Um, we do invite your participation. You can use the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions. We'll get back to them before the question ends. You can also raise your hand if you want, and I'll also call upon you. We're a small enough group where I think that will be manageable. But just a, a reminder, we are recording. So if you don't feel comfortable um, being on the recording, you can ask your question in the chat, and I'm more than happy to read it out to you today. So let's frame the conversation a bit. Workplace surveillance technologies are everywhere. They range from the commonplace, think uh, closed circuit surveillance cameras, um, robots making pizza and taking away jobs in the process. And they also include the more stealth technologies, the microphones embedded in um, your ID badge, the, um, the heart rate monitors or the, the sensors and seats understanding whether, you know, how productive are you? Are you actually working? Are you actually seated there? Um, cameras that are tracking physical movements of workers, recording events to monitor worker attentiveness. Some are problematic, some are not problematic, uh, but there's a lot of exploitation going on. And I'm gonna hand over first to you, Eduardo, because at Teddy, you have been using the Fair Work framework to evaluate six different platforms in, um, in Paraguay that are primarily impacting low wage workers. So perhaps you can set the scene for our discussion, what were the platforms you examined and what have been your key findings so far? How are they treating their workers? Thank you, Aiden. Uh, and thank you very much for giving us the possibility of presenting a bit of our work here at MOSFEST, uh, which is a space that we very much value and uh, we consider very close to our activism. So just to give everyone a glimpse of who we are, my name is Eduardo and I am a part of TEDIC, which is a digital rights organization based in Paraguay. And one of the things that we've been particularly interested for the past two years, I would say at this point, is uh, work in its intersection with technology and particularly digital technologies. And uh, within that interest, we're able to become partners uh, and become the local implementers of the fair work methodology uh, in our context in Paraguay. Uh, the fair work framework is an international methodology developed at Oxford University that evaluates six, uh, that evaluates platforms through different criteria. In the case of Paraguay, we use this framework uh, to evaluate six passenger transport and delivery services in our country. Um, for those who perhaps don't know the Fair Work methodology, Fair Work is an action research project, meaning that we don't necessarily only do the research and then try to publish that in a journal, but we really try to push for some sort of change uh, in benefit of workers' rights in this case. Uh, the research evaluates working conditions in the platform economy in more than 30 countries, uh, and the digital platforms that are part of the gig economy, which is uh, the economy that Fair Work is interested on, uh, are scored against five principles. Uh, 
fair pay, fair conditions, fair contract, fair management, and fair representation. And for each of those principles, platforms can score up to two, um, two points with a maximum of 10 points in an ideal outcome uh, of a platform that complies with all the principles that we believe are interesting. Uh, from the Hawaiian case, I would say that we're quite far away from the ideal outcome and, and, and the ideal scoring of 10 points. Uh, we evaluated six ride hailing and delivery platforms operating in Paraguay. So we had the more international ones, Bolt, Uber, InDriver, Pedidos Ya, and then two nationals, uh, Move and Vonchis. Uh, we had really low scores, uh, um, which are sort of like a signal for us that there's a lot to be done to guarantee basic labor standards in, uh, for platform workers in Paraguay. Uh, out of the six, just to give you a glimpse, out of the six studied platforms, only two platforms, Move and Pedidos Ya, uh, one national, one international, uh, were able to score any point. And even they uh, score really low. Uh, Move scored two points out of 10 and Pedidos Ya one out of 10. And I'm going to give you a bit more detail of, of why. Uh, even though I know we have a limited time, so I'm going to be very brief, uh, but just to give you a glimpse of what we evaluated per principle. Um, for the fair pay principle, we were not able to find sufficient evidence that any platform has mechanisms to ensure that workers earn at least the local minimum wage, or not even a living wage, which is a standard that doesn't exist in our country anyways, after subcontracting costs. Therefore, no platform could be awarded uh, a point for the principle of fair play. Uh, same happened on fair conditions. We did not find sufficient evidence that platforms in Paraguay take measures to mitigate work-related health and safety risks, or that they provide any sort of safety net for workers. Uh, therefore, we were unable to grant this point to any of the six evaluated platforms. Uh, and it is though worth noting that all platforms do require workers to have some kind of insurance, such as liability or vehicle insurance, for instance, but it's the workers, the one who have to bear the cost. Uh, and we were also not able, we weren't able to find any uh, provision from the platforms to offer sick pay in case of illness, other than COVID-19 in the case of some platforms, but we know that people get illness other than COVID as well. So it's not enough for them to say that, yeah, we offer some sort of compensation because of COVID. Fair contracts, uh, this is where it gets a bit more interested. Only Pedidos Ya was awarded the first point for fair contracts, meaning that they have a legal uh, presence in the country and that the contract is available in Spanish and accessible to workers at all times. Uh, and more importantly, also the changes in the contract can the, the changes in the contract can only be made with the re written agreement of both the worker and the platform, unlike other platforms that have more let's say, a discretionality to change uh, the terms and services or the contracts for those who have contracts. Um, no platform could be awarded the second point for fair contracts because we did not have sufficient evidence that platforms take appropriate steps to ensure that the contracts or the terms of conditions do not exclude liability for negligence nor are reasonable exempt uh, the platform from liability for working conditions. And then the last two, and I promise I'll stop here, at least for the moment. Uh, in the case of fair management, it also gets a bit more interesting because uh, the national platform MOVE, which transports, uh, were, uh, transports passengers, was able to score both the points of this principle. Uh, our research showed that MOVE has sufficient channels for workers to communicate with a human platform representative, which is very important to stress, and that there is a documented process for workers to appeal disciplinary actions, because one of the biggest problems, and perhaps connecting this with the surveillance topic, is that, of course, the platform economy and being a gig economy worker, uh, in a way, there is a surveillance by design approach of these platforms that pretty much quantify and have a very uh, thorough understanding of each of the actions that a worker is uh, doing within their hours of work. Uh, 
And most of the time, a lot of disciplinary actions come from a very top-down approach and workers are unable to do any sort of appeal, nor they really understand if there are appeal processes anyways. So MOVE makes a very interesting effort to really showcase the appeal process in a transparent way and make sure that all workers understand this. Uh, more importantly, MOVE also has anti-discrimination clause in its contracts and a documented commitment to achieve gender parity across its driver fleet, which is another important thing that uh, the the, this particular principle uh, measures and that we believe is important to, to, to stress as well. And lastly, fair representation, unfortunately, none of the platforms were able to uh, evidence the existence of a documented mechanism for the expression of collective worker voice, nor any uh, public state statement uh, saying that the platform wouldn't have any clover to deal wouldn't have any problem to deal with a collective body of workers. So no, no, no platform was able to award this. But was, we weren't able to award any of these points uh, for this particular principle. And then perhaps just a bit of food for thought that we can reflect on later. It is important to stress that when trying to think in the coincidences perhaps of the platforms that were able to get any point whatsoever, it was those uh, that both of, it, it was those that have a legal presence in the country, the one that at least have a bit more interesting practices to ana analyze, and that in a way uh, make a bit more of an effort to both comply with whatever existing law there is, and then more importantly to have some sort of benefits uh, for workers. So, like I said, there are a lot of challenges in terms of the gig economy. Not only thinking in the terms of the fact that there is uh, a surveillance by design in this kind of uh, space, but also in terms of so many other factors that are integral to the well-being of a worker and that at the moment, not only in Paraguay, but regionally really, because uh, all these scorings, and this is the interesting thing about fair work, you can do a comparison across countries, uh, but all of these platforms, the ones that are international at least, have pretty much the same low scoring across the region, and I would even argue across the globe. Thanks, Eduardo. That's, I, I really appreciate that overview. Just a very quick follow-up question, particularly on the surveillance by design aspect, as you term it. Are there any regulations in place in Paraguay to protect workers from the negative effects of workplace surveillance technologies? Unfortunately, I mean, the thing is that I think that at the moment, the understanding of public officials of working online, unfortunately, doesn't include uh, workers who work in the gig economy. So because of the pandemic, uh, there was a rush in regulating teleworking and a regulation came to place. Uh, there was a law that was passed uh, that was interesting in some things and uh, perhaps worrying on others. Uh, but it didn't, of course, uh, include workers in, uh, in the gig economy. It only include workers in general. But since there is a big, let's say, gap because none of these platforms really recognize uh, people who are uh, doing services in their platforms as workers, then that automatically, in a way, uh, leaves them out of that regulation. Regardless, that regulation is very limited um, because, like I said, uh, it, was, it was, let's say, regulated very at a speed level and as a response to the pandemic. And, uh, the law is like very general. It's sort of like uh, it says that workers who work under the telework modality uh, have the same rights and obligations than workers who per perform their duties in person and that the employer is responsible for providing and guaranteeing the maintenance of the equipments of programs that they are using. They don't do any reference on surveillance technology, but they do curiously do like an on-site surveillance. So they say is that um, when teleworking is carried out at, tele at the teleworker's home, is the term that they use, the employer can make visits to monitor compliance with occupational health and safety standards, as well as do the maintenance of the equipment. It says that it has to be um, agreed in advance with the worker, but in a way it puts a bit of a burden uh, for you to receive your employer in your home and whatever control they have to do. 
Luckily, I would say that because, and, and, and this is luckily in this sense, perhaps, but not on others, a lot of the regulations that happen in Paraguay, at least, they go, they, they become law, but then they are not really enforced. So after that, in between the pandemic and the, and the long time that, that the Congress took to pass that law, uh, nothing really happened afterwards because there aren't that many teleworkers and, or people declaring to be teleworkers. Um, but unfortunately, again, again, to your question, at least for gig economy platforms, these are not even standards or safeguards that are extended to them. Sure. Um, I'm going to call on Stephanie next because there's an interesting comment that you made there, Eduardo, about how even if there are laws that are on the books, they're not necessarily enforced. Stephanie, you're based in Canada, you essentially, you led the drafting effort behind Canada's privacy law at the moment. And so I'm curious to the point of, we stumble across a technology that is so egregious, we are, we are certain it is unlawful. The workers impacted are in a jurisdiction where there's a charter of fundamental rights or constitution or a similar instrument where privacy should be safeguarded. What should be the next step if we, if if the law simply is not being followed? If we come across an instance of a platform that is abusing its workers, I would assume first step would be lodging a complaint with the Data Protection Authority. But what do DPAs want to see in a complaint? Um, how can we make their lives easier so they act more swiftly? What if you're in a country like Ireland, where they're probably not going to investigate the complaint? Uh, well, and I, and I think you put your finger on the real problem. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that, uh, as Eduardo said, a lot of regulation of labor practices is pretty vague. And so uh, mostly in the contract between the individual and the employer or the individual and, the, you know, the contracting agency, in the case of gig workers, uh, you give away your rights. So there are very limited rights. Secondly, I think most employees don't exercise those rights on a regular basis. So one of the fundamental rights is the ability to access your data. Well, I'd like to find out, and I don't have a research budget to do it, but I'd like to find out how many people actually exercise their rights to see what the employer is doing with their geolocation data, for instance. Or we had an instance uh, that, that, that happened in Canada recently where the government has uh, removed TikTok or ordered all of its employees, federal employees, to remove TikTok from their uh, cell phones. Uh, and several provinces followed suit. Uh, frankly, I was quite shocked that an employee would be so naive as to put their personal TikTok on their appliance supplied by the uh, employer, because in most of these arrangements, the employer has the right over what is on employer supplied equipment. And if we are at this stage in this surveillance by design world, and I would I would peg that as being a, a good 20 years old, um, where people don't understand that they shouldn't be doing this, then we in civil society should be doing a better job of educating. So that's campaign number one we need. Campaign number two, and uh, Max Schrems at None of Your Business has launched a number of the sort of groundbreaking complaints in Europe, where at least there's a charter of rights in the GDPR. Um, there's not enough enforcement uh, money. It takes a lot of money to go up against a big platform like, well, let's say Facebook and Google, the, the, the suspects of the day, uh, they've got, you know, millions they can spend on their lawyers and the, the litigation budget for most data protection authorities is very, very small. Then, of course, you win a case, uh, you still have to go in and audit to see whether the actual uh, offenders have um, changed their ways. And not only are the audit provisions in many data protection laws very weak, but there's, you know, maybe a couple of a handful of auditors and in some offices, uh, even fewer than that. So they have to hire outside auditors. So, uh, you know, until we get to the point where in these cases, uh, the offender has to hire outside audit companies and prove that they have removed the offending software or technology, uh, we're not really going to get anywhere. So I think that's one of the, those are 
you know, a couple of points on this. Obviously, I could talk all day, so I don't want to take up all our time. But uh, I think labor law is one of the uh, labor, labor, data protection law that protects labor is one of the weak points. You, you would look hard to find a jurisdiction globally where they're able to actually crack down on offshore platforms. Thanks. Thanks. And, and just like a really brief follow-up question. And it's kind of a basic question, but in the context of an employment relationship, does an employee even have a right to privacy? Uh, yes, they do in certain respects. The data that is being gathered still has to uh, follow purpose. But unfortunately, uh, an employer can rationalize quite a bit of prying into the individual's activities under that purpose, uh, safety and health being one. I sit on the uh, Data Protection and Civil Liberties, uh, Privacy and Civil Liberties Board, Advisory Board of Palantir Technologies, and they have pretty powerful AI systems. And I'm very impressed, actually, with the engineering that they're doing to build in privacy protections. But uh, there's a lot of applications in safety and health for actual surveillance systems to make sure that employees are not uh, functioning in areas where they're going to be hurt, uh, where there's adequate staff on hand, where machines are functioning the way they should be functioning, checking on, you know, transistor health, you name it. There's all kinds of embedded technologies in modern factories. I'm talking about a factory situation here, uh, which is of concern. And, uh, it's one thing to build in the privacy controls. It's quite another to have a client actually use them absent data protection law that forces them or labor law that forces them. So once again, you're looking when you're talking about model behavior, which I can tell from Eduardo's talk, there isn't much of uh, you're hard pressed to find jurisdictions that have strong enough labor rights and strong enough data protection rights and where the two are actually dovetailing. And now I'm not sure I'm answering your question here. I went off on another rant, uh, uh, Aiden. So please follow up if I didn't answer that question. That's okay. Well, we have a, a hand raised from Kristen. I'll let you go ahead. Hi. Hi. Sort of dovetailing on that most recent conversation, um, I'm wondering about how the protections, if they do, um, overlap with, with uh, instances where workers are required to use their own phone, bring your own phone to work, um, when it's your own device, but you're using an app and cap they're capturing data from you through your own phone, how do the privacy protections work, if at all, in those instances? Because I see people working in the Whole Foods or Uber, whatever, using their own phones. So is there any movement on that? Uh if I could answer that, I I um I don't I don't think people are well covered because that's a voluntary uh, submission of your data. If somebody asked me to do that, and uh, I recognize that in some of these occupations, people can't afford a second phone, but I would definitely not be operating on the same phone with the employer because there's no boundaries on these apps. There was a fascinating article that I mean to follow up in the Washington Post last week about parishioners wanting to track down whether their priests were maintaining their uh, vows of celibacy. So they purchased a whole lot of uh, geodata from a data broker. Now, <laughs> that didn't happen 20 years ago, I have to admit. Uh, this is the kind of shocking market we've got for data. So, uh, you know, people need to be warned. If your employer is saying, provide your own phone, well, A, don't work for that company, or B, ask them for the money to purchase a cheap phone for them, you know? Eduardo, I saw your hand raised before. Did you have a follow-up comment? Otherwise, I'm going to... No, 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 it's okay. You, you can move forward. Perfect. Rashi. Thanks, Eduardo. Uh, Rashi, I think it's time to bring you into the conversation. You're based in India. Does the situation that Eduardo described in Paraguay and more broadly in Latin America sound familiar? Are there gig economy platforms also being rolled out in India? And if they are, and I imagine they are, are workers or policymakers pushing back in any meaningful way? 
it's it it mirrors the situation and I, I've been following a lot of the conversations that I could personally relate to. Just for me, when I joined my first company in a large corporation, I actually used my own phone. Uh, and luckily my my phone bill was was there there was a an, a part of the phone bill that was foot by the company. But then I'm oblivious to uh, the amount of data that I've voluntarily given into. I feel like some of the things are just some of the surveillance aspects are just baked into contracts. So we just, you know, kind of go away and we just go with the flow. I mean, I, I was a young, uh, young person out, out there through work. Um, so I, I wasn't too sure whether I want to offend anyone and, you know, companies have a very large reputation and taking on them on a legal aspect or even being taken seriously, because even in India, we might have a lot of regulations and legislations and fines and, 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 and the right people to be able to do these things, but uh, we do have an implementation issue. So most of the cases or most of the, or most of the aspects that perhaps would be seen as discriminatory in, in countries where there is robust legislation over here, people would say, maybe that's something you could let go because you need to pick your battles. So those are the conversations I've always had. Uh, but yes, there are a lot of the economy platforms that are being rolled out in India. India has taken on digitization very strongly. So we have a lot of the general apps, which, you know, the Ola and the Uber and the Swiggy and Urban Company, and they provide different services. We have a very app-based culture, especially in cities. We have concede services for everything, whether it's food delivery, late night services, home services, um, all of that. But um, whether there are there have been a lot of key issues, especially during the pan pandemic with low pays, uh, lack of job security, long working hours. I personally was involved in a project around sustainable fashion where we understood the plight of the textile garment workers, especially women who have always traditionally been given short-term contracts. Um, so there is no question of you having uh, the additional amenities of, you know, medical care or pension services um, or even having a fund or given incentives to work clearly so i feel like the onus is a lot on the culture and the values of the company rather than anything else because a lot of people are just in survival mode and they're really not interested in complaining or pushing legislation to move forward to be able to show something um you know they don't have the luxury of seeking justice i would say uh, but uh, many uh, in response to the gig economy that is going on, there have been many alternate aspects, especially in food delivery, where we have um, we have a coalition of of a lot of restaurants coming together and promoting uh, directly ordering from them uh, because of the huge margins that are given by you know Ola and and Zomato and Uber. So, for example, in Mumbai, I had I had seen an example of uh, the the black and yellow taxis of them coming together and creating an app so that you know there is there is slightly a higher margin and there's more regulation because hey we're all technology savvy and all of us would be using the same means. Um, so that's a very interesting feature that we've seen of you know paying uh, paying or ordering through applications directly where they're very transparent about the commissions given and how much is paid what. Um, and there's also in 2020 the Indian Federation of App-Based Transport Workers organized strikes to demand better pay and working conditions for, for ride hailing platforms. But yeah, many of them don't really work. We've also seen a lot of people who who do move on to public transportation, uh, which seems to be a better option in some cases and in some cases not. Um, policymakers in India have been taking steps to address some of the gig economy worker issues. Uh, the Indian government introduced a labor code and they provide social security benefits to gig workers, including pension insurance and, and pensions. But then, you know, who is there to really track that and look through it? We do see a lot of implementation aspects, and especially in the surveillance state of design aspects, I think that is very problematic in our in our country as well because that's kind of baked into the contract. Um, we have, uh, you know, productivity tracker apps that one has to install while you're working, and one has to use that every day to be able to show that you know you're actually doing something or going ahead. So, um, yeah, I feel like a lot of the contracts where you just kind of you know you give away your rights rather than really looking at it because it's just something that's there and you just have to deal with it I guess yeah so that's uh, a little bit about perhaps my my lived experiences uh, of working uh, in India as, as as a gig worker and some of the instances that I have seen but I would again say that 
regulations are are only as good as how much you enforce and given the population that we have it is it is hard to be able to go through that mechanism it has to be more on the onus of having a uh, better culture and some of them do and some of them don't thanks rashi and thank you for sharing those personal anecdotes very curious about you, you refer to saying a federation of gig workers. Is that like a, a, a trade union or like a worker collective? Uh, it's a trade union and worker collective. We've also seen a trade union and worker collective with restaurants who also uh, levy service charge. Um, some, of, some of the high-end restaurants who make it mandatory to levy service charge. And then there's been a lot of conversation around that. Uh, where, but, but, but we're not the US. We don't, um, this is something that I'm also... I, I don't find it interesting where we like cloning ideas from different countries and applying them to India. Uh, I'm I'm not sure whether we even have, uh, you know, as Eduardo said, um, a minimum wage that that we give. It really depends on person to person and and what sort of economy you're in. And yeah, it's just, uh, it's it's different here. It, uh, you can't apply other regions. I mean, you can perhaps look at the behavioral aspects of it and, and how consumers react to it, but we really can't apply um, issues that are there in the US or Canada to what happens in India. It's very different. Yeah. Well, Perhaps, you. Aideen, if I can add them something uh, just to not lose uh, what Russia was saying, I would even say that even the advocacy strategies that sometimes are designed in the global north are not necessarily uh, replicable here in our global south context because uh, just to give you an example that i have on the top of my head uh, a lot of the discussions uh in, in in how to push for better improvement of the gig economy at least is to put a lot of the burden in how you as a consumer choose uh certain services rather than our others right let's say okay you should choose the services of the platforms who have the better ratings the better scorings normally those are services that are more expensive. And in contexts like ours, where people who have uh, who are economically disadvantaged uh, and also don't have public transportation available in their hands, of course, they're going to choose the cheaper service. And it's not the best strategy to put the burden on, uh, on how to improve the gig economy in consumers, because there are so many types of consumers that are using also the gig economy. Because in the end, we are talking about an inequality system, and and in 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 a, and, and a structure. There's a structural inequality situation that ends up connecting us all in the precarity uh, of the gig economy. And uh, regardless, or by acknowledging that, it is also important to acknowledge that different strategies won't work across the globe, and that there are there, that we need to make uh, fit for purpose. Uh, strategies for each of our contexts. Definitely. One fits all strategy perhaps would not work uh, in India or even 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 uniformly across India. We're just so different. Um, for example, Bangalore, where I usually reside, has the highest wages um, in, in the country, uh, which is why a lot of people flock towards uh, Bangalore for the opportunities that it offers. Um, and then when you have says Mumbai and Delhi who have different wages for different aspects. So that's, India is very complex in that, in that sense. Thanks. And Rashi, did you want to expand upon something that we, we discussed in sort of the prep for this session about how many of the people that are drawing attention to these inju injustices that they see are themselves moving from project to project, either because they work in a civil society organization that is being funded on a project-based basis, in which case there are very strong parallels and differences between uh, gig economy workers and the project-based work that some civil society organizations engage in in order to draw attention to what is happening. I've personally stayed a lot away from the conversations with the Indian civil society in particular because I just find the, I I don't know, I find the whole ecosystem, I mean, it there is a lot of, I would say, solidarity in the ecosystem, but it's also a very, it's also a very small ecosystem where 
you always find funding given to the usual suspects. And even when you have funding opportunities, that would also say that you need to be an established organization and have a track record of five or seven. And it usually goes to the same people. So for me, it's more like, uh, you know, you're just fueling the five or seven pioneers who've been there for the last 15 or 20 years rather than actually giving way to new voices. And I also see something very uh, disturbing where I always look at interns that are, um, that are, you know, probably hired for or don't have a fixed contract who who make a lot of the suggestions or who who are pioneering some of these interesting projects and are not given due credit. And it's always, you know, someone else. So I, I feel like there's a lot of disparity within civil society itself where um, you always have the the top three, four of them who are who are paid really well. And then everyone else is just, you know, kind of just more like a trickle down approach. Uh, so that's how I would look at it um, from from my side. But no, I I would say that civil society does have a long way to go. But then again, you also have you also have other think tanks who are well established. It depends on where the research is coming from and what the basis is. Some of them work really well. Some of them do work project basis. So there's a lot of flexibility. I would say uh, some of them can work on other aspects as well, and they're allowed to. But in India, this all usually very frowned upon with people having two or three jobs. Um, it's not it's not common practice. I would say now perhaps it is, but maybe in in the civil society aspect, in some cases it is someone is doing a fellowship and then they have research and they teach. But yeah, being um, like having that sort of duality is still not common practice. I mean, especially if you're in a large corporation, large corporations don't necessarily pay you very fairly. Um, they would they would fire you if they found out that you were doing something outside this. Yeah, that's true. And that is why certain technologies, like some of the features that Microsoft is adding to Office 365 at the moment that can supposedly detect um, worker discontent or worker organizing practices, which are just being beta tested and rolled out to hundreds of millions of people at once, are uh, so problematic and quote unquote interesting. We're running out of time, unfortunately. So I'm gonna, as I, alluded to at the top of the hour, we do changes in the air at the moment. There is policy innovation, as Emily Taylor has termed it, and renewed interest in exploring how the internet should be governed in the 2030s. So we did also want to discuss today the Global Digital Compact that was proposed by the UN Secretary General, because there are potential implications for workers. And more importantly, there is the potential at the moment for us and for civil society, for trade unions, for worker collectives to be able to feed into these processes over the next 18 months to 24 months. And so it feels quite timely to bring this up. So under the UN's proposed Global Digital Compact, a new round of conversations have emerged around artificial intelligence, internet fragmentation, connectivity and privacy, among others. And these are topics that are, of course, very topical and are very necessary, be that for workers, for worker collectives, for trade unions, for civil society more broadly. No one is debating their uh, importance. There is a discussion, though, around whether the UN is the right forum for these conversations. And there is a discussion around who should be feeding into these processes. And the modalities of how these topics will be addressed in the future are very unclear, but some scholars and policy analysts believe there's a very real danger to the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. We saw last month in Cuba, um, China and the group of 77, it's actually more than 77 countries, but they call themselves the group of 77, um, uh, spoke about the Global Digital Compact and what they perceive as an issue with it which is that it is not a multilateral process, that the idea that um, it, it, in their minds, um, the Tunis agenda has a huge flaw, which is that it opens up participation to non-state actors, to market actors and to um, civil society actors. But the group of 77 and China believe maybe when we think about our decisions about the internet are made in the future, we should only be involving governments. So, Here's where I'm going to bring you into the conversation, Stephanie. 
You've been thinking about the UN's review of WISIS, the World Summit on Information Society, which will be held in 2025 on the 20th anniversary of, um, of the original WISIS that concluded with the Tunis Agreement. Maybe you can give us just a little history lesson on why does WISIS matter, does it matter? Um, how has the UN system historically perceived non-state and non-market actors? And what will you be looking out for ahead of WISIS plus 20? Sorry to be slow on the unmute. Uh, thanks, Aiden. Um, I was around for the for the last uh, round, and I have to say I worked in the Department of Communications in Canada for many years, and my colleagues went to the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and I, you know, it was my job to follow all this stuff for a long time. Uh, while I was working on privacy. And the ITU does not have a very strong track record of engaging in uh, social cultural issues like, for instance, uh, and rights issues like the protection of privacy, for instance, they did nothing. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm being blunt here. Um, and so the WISIS, the first WISIS uh, was uh, it's the it's the work, the collaboration that 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 went into the two years prior to the first uh, meeting uh, of the IGF that uh, these summits really brought industry, government, and civil society together for the first time to discuss what an information society looked like. And I I encourage everybody to get back in there and look at the early WISIS documents and the Tunis agenda, because what we see now is a bid to basically drag that whole what is an information society back into the hands of government. Now, I would argue that government uh, has a very poor track record in terms of managing this. It, in, in put in the context of the International Telecommunications Union, there's always been this um, a dividing line between carriage and content. And that has been carried on in the um, the I-STARS, in the uh, organizations that have looked after the multi-stakeholder model of building the internet. So, you know, ICANN, for instance, which looks after domain names um, and numbers, uh, does not look at content, uh, except insofar as intellectual property gets worked into domain names. And that's a long digression that I won't go down that rabbit hole. But um, but the problem that arises right now, and you can hardly say that China and the group of 77 are wrong, is we're not really being effective against cybercrime. And there are huge criminal syndicates that are getting away with uh, really bamboozling citizens. Uh, the it has taken quite a few rounds of the cybercrime treaty to basically do some basic stuff. But once again, we're against we're up against the a problem of enforcement. They rely on the private sector for enforcement, and yet they're not willing to credit the private sector for managing certain things. I volunteer and have for the past 10 years that I can trying to get them to respect privacy. It seems to be working, but that's not me. That's the GDPR and the fines uh, that is working there. But nevertheless, uh, as much as I criticize ICANN, as Winston Churchill said, you know, it's a rotten system, but it's better than the alternative. He said that about democracy. I would say it about the multi-stakeholder model. Even though we've got several functioning multi-stakeholder models in you know, in forestry and in in uh, in the management of the internet, it's still a young concept. And so I think that there's an opportunity in this digital compact and in the WISIS plus 20 to reinforce the multi-stakeholder model, point out the frailties in it and try to make it better. I think it's really important that people weigh in in these open calls for comments on the digital compact and, and that they participate in the WISIS plus 20 because there's a very real threat. Uh, we've seen a wave of authoritarian governments taking over. There's a very real threat. As much as we admit that the platforms emanate principally from the United States and that the United States is uh, uh, certainly not as, as democratic and all good as they claim, 
it's a lot better than some of the alternatives that are going on at the moment. ICANN is gradually weaning itself from U.S. domination, having done the IANA transfer. But there's a ton of work to be done. These things take time. People are impatient. Uh, if we don't get in there and work on this, I think we'll lose a lot. Thanks. Thanks for that, Stephanie. And I'm about to call, you in a, call on you in a moment, Eduardo. Just a brief reminder that the Global Digital Compact is open for public input until the end of next month, until the end of April. It is quite a lengthy process. It is not as simple as writing a letter. Uh, you need to sort of establish legitimacy for the perspective you're bringing. And it does ask you to justify how you have surfaced the ideas that you have brought with others. And it does want you to sort of quantify how many people you have consulted with who agrees with your perspectives, who does not agree with your perspectives. Quite a lengthy process, but it is an uh, open process that anyone can input into. Really encourage you to read through the Global Digital Compact, understand the impact on worker uh, and labor rights, and to think about how you might be able to engage in this process. And feel free to reach out to me directly after this call if you want to discuss that further. Eduardo, I saw your hand up, please go ahead. No, I think uh, uh, just to build on something that Stephanie said, I would also say that the Global Digital Compact should be a, an instance that us as multi-stakeholder uh, advocates should really use and try and, and try to use that as a process that really strengthens the multi-stakeholder approach. Because right now also, it does feel a bit like we are not talking uh, between stakeholders as we used to at some point. There is a lot of distrust between civil society organizations and private companies specifically. And I think that this shift and, and, and this narrative that you were mentioning most likely will not leave or uh, exclude companies. It would only exclude civil society organizations because we're the easier ones to, to, to disregard or like the academia. Probably states will continue engaging with private sector companies in developing their standards and developing other things that they do. Uh, so in a way, the multi-stakeholder model is indeed what we need to defend to continue being relevant in the process. But for that, we also need to do some revisions in how we engage with one another. This was just like a further reflection. And I think that the, G the, the Global Digital Compact could be a starting point. Thanks, Eduardo. Did you want to maybe expand in any way on um, either WSIS Plus 20 or on UNESCO's Internet for Trust um, conference that I understand Teddy has been engaging with? I read the, the public submission that you made on that. I mean, do you see all of these, to borrow Emily Taylor's term, policy innovation coming out of the UN at the moment as positive opportunities to rethink how we govern the internet, to rethink how we can improve the multi-stakeholder model? Is there anything good that can come out of this? I don't know. I think that our perception, at least, at least in the Internet of Trust event in Paris, is that we're at a point where we're not going to be able as uh, stakeholders who are calling for more, let's say, uh, let me rephrase that. We're at a point where regulation is definitely going to come. Like that is the mandate that we believe we have identified. And all these public callings to be more measured and to try to be uh, not necessarily rush on a potential regulation, either on content moderation or other issues, they're not going to work anymore. There is a, a, a will by international organizations connected very much to uh, states uh, that need to regulate this or that perceive that they need to regulate this in order to combat some of the problems that we know uh, we have at the moment. So I'm quite curious on the development of this. And even though we have done substantial, I mean, there was like round one on the UNESCO document, round two, and now round three, not round three, I'm very curious and really trying to see what is the final outcome. I definitely believe that there was an improvement from one to two. Uh, and hopefully we will see a further improvement from version two to three as well. But in the end, I feel that, uh, again, there are realities and contextual realities that are different between countries and institutional realities that are different among countries. And perhaps, you know, very broad 
uh, high level principles that are then on responsibility of different states to enforce in their context is the, the gap where I also see the danger uh, because not all of our countries have that capacity. I mean, Paraguay doesn't even have a data protection law that is uh, integral and that has an independent authority. So even from that standpoint, there are difficulties, unlike other contexts like the EU that, I mean, we can argue that it could also be very problematic to regulate certain aspects of the online world, even if you are in the EU, but at least they have certain safeguards in place. Thanks, Eduardo. We are reaching the top of the hour, so I'm going to turn to Rashi next. But if you, there are any comments, feel free to put them, or questions, feel free to put them in the chat or to raise your hand, and happy to take some of your thoughts. But before I do, Rashi, um, you work a lot on addressing the gender digital divide, and you've been thinking about how we can use the Global Digital Compact and the WISIS Plus 20 renewal process to potentially promote the empowerment of women and girls in the digital space. So yeah, I, I do feel like the the WISIS Plus 20 process could also help identify um, and prevent women and girls to you know accessing different digital technologies, um, which includes initiatives for digital literacy, skills training, um, and also having access to uh, affordable devices um, and um, stable connectivity to be able to, you know, uh, empower them in a social, economic, and even entrepreneurial sense. Uh, we have so many women because of culture barriers in India who are not allowed to move out or step out of their homes or step out of their uh, jurisdictions uh, for various reasons. And I feel like the digital aspect um, is going to address issues of, um, you know, um, and giving them access to equal opportunities in the digital revolution that uh, we currently live in, uh, whether it's, you know, supporting women-led digital startups or um, efforts to increase representation of women in digital leadership roles. Um, also on the other side, uh, you did mention AI and uh, the growing trend of um, generative AI um, and uh, algorithms uh, kind of looking at deep fix um, and, and the problem of how it could accentuate uh, online violence and harassment, uh, not, not to public figures, but now even to uh, regular people. Um, looking at uh, deep fake pornography, which is a huge issue uh, that, that we see rising, um, you know, growing problem of how do we prevent it? How do we implement policies for it? Uh, the UK has a specific policy for it now. Um, and how do we promote digital safety and security and have redressal mechanisms to ensure that victims are able to uh, address these issues and, um, yeah, uh, also look at uh, you know responding to and and preventing online violence and harassment. So I also feel like it can also encourage governments and other stakeholders to adopt a more I would say um, gender responsive policies that take into account the needs and priorities of women and girls, and also of course uh, enable and augment participation and decision making processes towards uh, the development of these policies. Yeah, I'm not going to take too much time because I don't want to eat into the Q&A section. Thank you, Rashi. We have three minutes, so that's perfect amount of time for one or two questions. Uh, either in the chat or to raise your hand. Um, if there are no questions, we will have time to give each of our speakers a 60 second closing statement. I'm not seeing any, uh, any hands raised just yet. Um, so, Eduardo, did you have any closing thoughts uh, before we wrap up the session? Uh, perhaps going back to the title again and, you know, how the dynamics of work are still evolving and are still uh, resignifying themselves through digital uh, means. We're only seeing the beginning. So I would say that the future of work is quite a passionate uh, field of research. Uh, that we need more people on board. And, um, and more than anything, uh, make a call or, or make, let's say, perhaps not on this particular group of people who are very much knowledgeable, but I feel like there is this trend, like all techno-utopian techno -utopian trends that uh, 
perceive that the technologization and the digitization uh, of work will only bring uh, development and will only bring well-being to workers. Uh, us who work at the tech and society intersection definitely see that there are problems. But I would, in, in order not to be like very dystopian, I would, I, I also feel that it's very interesting to see uh, workers' strategies for resistance. I'm quite a TikTok fan, for instance. So there's this lot of uh, content created as, you know, how can you circumvent, let's say, uh, the the Microsoft Teams uh, surveillance of your keyboard. So you just put an apple in your tap uh, keyboard, and then that automatically um, uh, disguises the fact that you're perhaps not exactly eight hours on your computer, but you're, I don't know, like going to the bathroom or something like that. So uh, it's very interesting to see at the same time how the increase of these, the use of these technologies to surveil workers. And then at the same time, how workers are also always finding ways to resist uh, those impositions. Um, so I would say that there's a lot of uh, studying that needs to be done there as well in terms to better understand and find the middle point Thank you for that, Eduardo. Stephanie, you have a minute. Uh, thanks very much. I, I, I share some of the cynicism that Eduardo expressed about some of these initiatives, but uh, you have to temper realistic cynicism with optimism. And uh, just as he's looking to uh, collectives to uh, move forward, we have an opportunity to try to coordinate globally and change the culture and change each culture in each country, because obviously, as she said, it's different. So uh, there's been not enough focus on worker rights in terms of surveillance. And this I see as an opportunity. Uh, WISIS, the first WISIS was lean on uh, union activists participating. I think we were unaware of how badly we'd be impacted by the internet and by cellular technologies at the time. Uh, so here's another opportunity to get some global efforts, meet some people, form coalitions. So um, hopefully WISIS, WISIS plus 20 will give us that opportunity. So I would encourage everybody to reach out and do what they can. And if, uh, if you need a government to take your arm and drag you in, then do that. The British government is doing it. I don't, I don't know what's happening with the Canadian government. So I'm going to check into that. But each country... Have a look and see whether your government will engage with civil society and and uh, get you engaged in what's going on there because it is very important. Thank you, Stephanie. That is so true. And Rashi, you get the last word. You have yeah, no, uh, I I do agree with cynicism and the optimism aspects. Um, I used to feel very left out in the space because I, I started working remotely in 2018, um, but I feel like the pandemic normalized. Um, a lot of aspects, it brought in a lot of structure. I feel like it did also contribute to a lot of regulation and legislation that was needed. People were recognized, people could trust remote first companies. And there are so many remote first, first companies who actually respect workers' rights um, and actually look very thoughtfully into coalitions. So I, I do feel like that's very important. Um, but I do feel like this is a very growing space. There is a lot of research that needs to be done. Uh, there is a lot of education around this that needs to be done because I feel like in privacy, especially in India, I mean, the more you educate people around this, it really helps. Just the basic thing. So I think more than uh, having digital literacy as a one-off approach, we need to have it in curriculum. We need to ensure that it's it's baked into policy levels, it's baked into awareness levels, like how you have generative AI being spoken at every dinner table. Why not have, you know, aspects that are normalized to be denormalized and say, hey, this is not how it is. And the digital economy has kind of fueled that in our case. You know, you have when you uh, in, in the global south or in emerging economies have access to uh, the wages of uh, and, you know, working with clients across the world. It kind of brings that parity in, and that and that is interfering with a lot of, um, with a lot of I would say, intellectually, uh, with a lot of intellectual work and research that's being done in India. So I would say that we have a long way to go, and all of these processes, especially the multi-stakeholder process, um, having a having a having a top-down approach is not going to work, and having infrastructure to be able to arrive at common agreements, and having the inclusion baked into the decision-making process is the way to go forward because, you know, the alternatives 
don't really help. And this is the necessary evil that we all need to tackle. And okay. also, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. I'm sorry. We have to wrap up now because another session is going to use this Zoom room. There is a finite number of Zoom rooms, apparently. And we've gone a few minutes over. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining the session today. I will share a link to the recording and the transcript when it's available. It will also be translated into Spanish, which is useful. But thank you so much, everyone, for this great conversation. Looking forward to continuing it another time. Thank you. Ciao, Thank ciao. you. Bye. <laughs> Things up, Eleanor. Uh, yeah, no problem. I hope you you enjoyed your uh, your session. My connection uh, dropped like the last two minutes. I was uh, so I missed the, the closing remarks, but it was a great session. So thank you so much for organizing it and facilitating it. My pleasure.